Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us for another exciting fireside chat. This time I'm here with Jeff, who is the author of Forever Employable, among other greatest hits. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Ellen. Thanks so much for having me. So I'd love to know a bit more about you. Can you maybe get us, uh, give us a bit of info on your personal story and how you got started in the crazy product world? Absolutely. Uh, I was a broke musician in the 90s. I toured around the U.S. with some bands trying to be a rock star. Uh, and while that was awesome, it was also uh, <laughs> a very, very, uh, I, was, I was very, very broke. Uh, didn't, didn't make any money. And so in the late 90s, I decided that uh, my rock star dreams were not going to uh, pan out. And in the late 90s, due to the, the, the original dot-com boom, uh, if you could spell HTML in 1999, you could get a job. And so I could spell it, I could write it. And so I got a job as a web designer in 1999, building websites and web 1.0. Um, shortly thereafter, became an information architect and then a UX designer. I spent a decade doing that and building design teams in various size organizations. And then what was really interesting was that about 10, 12 years ago, I was trying to solve the problem of UX design and agile software development with my teams and some other colleagues and friends in New York and, and around the US. And uh, we stumbled across a way of working that made sense. And uh, we called it Lean UX. And I wrote a book about it called Lean UX. And that book did very well, continues to do very well. And in fact, it uh, just got published in its third edition, which is pretty amazing 10 years later. And um, since the publication of Lean UX, I have been working uh, as a, a trainer, a consultant, a coach, and a public speaker, helping organizations build uh, really customer-centric digital products, um, great product management teams and organizations, and really just better companies that are focused more on, on customer needs than just sort of building features and making money. Amazing. And the companies that you work with, um, in uh, in product management, we're always talking about being obsessed with the problem and not the solution. When you're working with these companies, what are the problems that you're trying to solve? Uh, these days, uh, look, I, I generally speaking, I work on process problems rather than product problems. So if, if you think of the, my services as a product or as a service, right, the problem that it solves is organizations trying to be more customer centric organizations trying to be more agile, organizations trying to be more cross-functional and collaborative, and helping them take advantage of what it means to be a software-based organization these days. And, and generally speaking, I work with a lot of large companies, and so they don't, they don't tend to think of themselves as software companies. They think of themselves as banks or insurance companies or retailers. And I help them think, uh, re reposition themselves as tech companies. And then what does that mean for their ways of working? Mm -hmm. And without calling anyone out, obviously, or divulging insider secrets, what are some of the main other mistakes that are, are these companies making? Like what, what, are the, what are the things that they're not getting quite right when you, uh, when you come to join them? Look, the, the, the main, the, the stories are generally similar across all these organizations. I tend to work with large organizations. Lar large organizations are successful. And because they're big and successful and they've been around for decades, they believe that they know what's best for the customer. And they believe that they can dictate that to the customer. And there was a point in time where that was true. But that's no longer true. This idea that you can simply conceive of a product or a service or an offering, create it, market it, and people will buy it is incredibly risky. And it's unnecessarily risky because we have the ability to learn much more quickly today whether or not we're building products of value. And that's what you're seeing with, with the digitally native organizations that are sort of you know crushing the markets these days, the Amazons, the Googles, the Netflixes of the world, right? They don't think like that. They don't think like companies who say, we're going to build this, it's going to be awesome, and you're going to love it, they test and they learn all the time. And so the biggest challenge with these legacy organizations that I work with is, frankly, teaching them humility, teaching them to recognize that they don't have all the answers, that they don't know exactly what's going to work in the marketplace, and that they need to ask more questions 
talk to more customers, and ultimately be humble enough to change course in the face of evidence that contradicts their original opinions. Mm -hmm. And maybe on the flip side of my last question, is there anything that these companies that don't consider themselves tech companies, is there anything that they're doing that they're getting right that maybe tech companies could learn from? That's a really great question. Um, I mean, look, there's, there's deep, deep, deep subject matter expertise. And I think that that's hugely beneficial when it comes to thinking how to better serve customers, right? There's a sense of what people want and how they prefer to, to use these particular products and services to where digitally native companies don't have at least those decades of, of data and an insight and analysis. I think the other thing that, look, there are uh, situations where um, simple, straightforward planned upfront project management is advisable where there's low risk, there's high certainty, and, and you, you have a high level of confidence in a particular initiative. Big companies are good at those kinds of projects as well. And you tend to see that sort of the, the newer companies um, struggle with that kind of, kind of work a bit more. Uh, so now, finally, let's talk about the book, Forever Employable. What was the inspiration behind Forever Employable? There it is. There, there it is. is. There it is. Um, Forever Employable was a direct response to sort of, if you think about it from a product perspective, it was a direct response to customer requests. So um, I have been uh, writing and teaching and speaking on the topics of product management and design and agile and lean UX for a long time. And I've built a, a business for myself. I, and I, I've spoken in conferences, I've written several books. Um, and almost on a weekly basis, I get a couple of inbound requests from folks. Hey, Jeff, how did you get that speaking gig? How did you get that? You know, how did you get to speak at Mind the Product? How did you uh, get the book deal? You know, how did you uh, get to interview that particular person? And there was a point in time where these where these were coming in on such a frequent basis. I was going to start writing responses to them individually, and then I thought about writing responses for them on media, maybe a lengthy post. And then I decided, you know what? There's a story here, and I'm going to write a book about it. And so really, it was a response to a bunch of inbound um, requests, right? What we call like pulls on the system, right? People are, are asking me for this content. And so I wrote uh, Forever Employable, which is essentially, it's my story about how I built this business with examples from many other people who have built similar and significantly larger businesses than my own. So it's semi-autobiographical, and it starts roughly when I was 35 and then moving forward from there in time. Mm -hmm. Does it have the bonus chapters about when you were a broke musician touring the US? Because I would read that. It starts with it starts with that story for sure. I mean, I mean, and there is that. And look, and, and there's tremendous value in that. It's interesting. At the time when you're living, you're living that stuff, like all you care about is is rock and roll and your friends and having a good time and maybe trying to make it as a musician. But in hindsight, uh, bands are startups, right? You're building a product. You're, you and, and your buddies get together and you have this crazy idea and you think it's going to change the world, right? Does that sound familiar? Um, and then you pour everything you have into that idea. You pour all your money, all your time, all your effort. You sleep on floors, you eat ramen, you know, you sleep eight to a motel room somewhere in Pennsylvania, you know, in the middle of nowhere, um, because you're trying to make this a thing that people love, that they follow, that they pay you for, that they tell their friends about, right? All the things that we try to achieve uh, with products, we're trying to find product market fit with this. And I did this for a long time with, with a couple of different bands. I did this for about six or seven years. And in hindsight, that experience was tremendously valuable in a modern product context because it taught me how to be an entrepreneur. And I, and I didn't think I was an entrepreneur, right? But being in a band means you're an entrepreneur. Um, it taught me how to, you know, how to look for our audience, how to do product marketing, how to, you know, how to, you know, position uh, products, right? Because, the, you know, so one of the bands that I toured with was very easy to describe, right? It was just basically melodic Southern rock, right? Very easy, right? But the other band I toured with, very difficult 
to describe. We played all kinds of music and weird time signatures. And, you know, I learned a lot of that people don't, people can't dance to odd time signatures, you know? And so that gets a little frustrating for them as well. And so that experience turned out to be uh, extremely valuable. And, and not only was it a great time, and those guys are still to this day, my best friends. I talk to them almost every day on chat. Um, but I learned a tremendous amount about product, product management, design, product positioning, marketing, entrepreneurship. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic experience. I think that's such a testament to sort of the patchwork quilt that is the product industry and the tech industry where you can come from any sort of background and you can make product work from you. Because I know we have a lot of people in our community who are aspiring product managers who are looking to get in for the first time, but they think, oh, I'm not an engineer or I've uh, mm -hmm. I've not done design before. How am I going to make it work? And if you can be a broke rock star who makes it in the product management world, well, and any any background can be made to fit. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I mean, again, it's, it, it's, it's super interesting because, again, it doesn't seem relevant. But if you're out there producing something, it doesn't matter what it is, and someone is in theory going to consume that thing, right? then you're making product of some kind. And it's a great way to look at it. I mean, you can think about it from very the literal sense, like uh, you know, if you had a cupcake business in high school, right? <laughs> you were a product manager, right? You, you're making product and selling it to an audience and trying to fit, you know, get, find product market fit. So it, it's really, it's really a, an interesting perspective on stuff we've done in the past, to your point. Mm -hmm, very true. We're definitely words of wisdom in there. Um, so you've mentioned, well, we've talked about Forever Employable and you mentioned uh, Lean UX, but I know that there's another two that you've written as well. If someone wanted the complete set uh, of your books, what are the other two? <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> um, no, uh, so Lean UX was the first was the first book and the one that really kind of changed my career dramatically because it, it was such a such a big success that um, people really began to to, uh, to ask me not to, they asked me less to design products and services and work on products and services and more to teach the stuff in the book. What was really interesting is that in the process of teaching Lean UX, I started to get some insight again market feedback on it. And every time I taught a class on Lean UX, and it happens to this day, we finish the course and somebody in the course inevitably says, Jeff, that was amazing. I wish my boss was here, right? Because my boss doesn't work this way and my company doesn't let me work this way. And when you hear that enough times over and over and over again, that's inbound signal, right? That's pulling on the system, that's market feedback. And so my co-author Josh Seiden and I saw that as an opportunity to write another book. And the book is called Sense and Respond. And it's a business book, which was a really interesting challenge for us because neither one of us thought of ourselves as business book authors. And it was a business book published by Harvard Business Review Press. And it was a conversation for the bosses, for the leaders, for the executives that made a case. Um, basically, it, it, it has two, it's a two-part thesis in the book. The first part of the first half of the book makes the case that you're in the software business. So the thing we talked about before, it's designed for, you know, somebody who's been a banking executive for 20 years, right? And so the first, the first half of the book really tries to make the case that you're in the software business. That's how the market works this, these days. That's how we scale product. That's how we reach our audience. The second half of the book makes the case that if you believe that you're in the software business, then managing and running a software-based business is fundamentally different than you're used to. And here's how, and here's how to do that. So that's what Sense and Respond is about. And then in between Sense and Respond and um, Forever Employable, I wrote a short book. It's a very short book. I think it's only 6,000 words. Which you call it a long essay, really. Um, and, and it's called Lean versus Agile versus Design Thinking. And this book came out of a conversation with a client who said, look, I am teaching my teams all of these things. I've got my product folks learning lean and lean startup. I've got my design folks doing design thinking. I've got my engineering folks doing agile. And it's not coming together. This beautiful synergy of process and productivity and efficiency and customer centricity and agility. None of that stuff's happening. Everybody's going in different directions. I thought I was doing everything right. And so this short book, Lean Agile and Design Thinking, is designed to reconcile those three processes in, in a very clear way that says, look, they, are, they use three different sets of language or three different vocabularies, but fundamentally, they're the same, same idea. Like, you know, philosophically, they're all attempting to do 
the same thing. And what's interesting about that particular book is that that book was an MVP. It was an experiment for, for potentially starting a book publishing business. So I was learning how to self-publish books. I was trying to see if there was a market for self-published books. I was trying to see if there was a market for very short business books, very practical short business books. And that book was also very successful. And so based on the back of that, again, Josh Seiden and I, we launched a business called Sense and Respond Press that we ran for four years and published 20 short business books by other authors on topics for uh, like product management, design and agile, all those types of things. And running that business, was that, as you say, the same as running um, what we would think of as a more traditional tech industry business, like a um, something that has a digital product? Was the process the same or were there like slight differences? It's interesting. Um, it, it, it was in many ways not particularly uh, uh, modern because book publishing, book, book, book publishing is interesting, right? It's evolved. It's evolved to the point where there, like, for example, you don't need to have inventory today, right? So when we published Lean UX back in 2013, you know, they would print 3000 copies of the book, ship it around the world, some to Amazon. And then when those were exhausted, they would print another 3000 copies. But if you don't sell those 3000 copies, you're sitting on top of, you know, 2,950 copies of the book that you have to send back or, or eat the cost of. So one of the benefits of, of modern book publishing is there is no inventory. Everything's print on demand or it's digital or it's audio. So that's really nice. And look, and, and if you wanted to make updates to your self-published books, because there's no inventory, you could update as much as you want. There's some cost and some effort to that, but not too bad. Aside from that, everything else is the same in the way, the way it's always been because to publish a book, right? Like, so, so this is self-published, um, but at some point, right there, there's a, there's a it, you have to say that's enough, right? Like it's done. It's a snapshot in time. You, like there's, there, there's a clear definition of done, right? And, that, and done means publishable and then ultimately published. And so there is still that, that element to it, which unlike software, right, you're, you're continuously improving on a much shorter time scale, right? Theoretically, right, we could publish updates to, to self-published books. You could do it every week if you wanted to, but it's crazy, right? It's a book. There, there needs to be some, some longevity. Like, why did you write a book if it, if it you know, if it goes out of, uh, like, if it starts to be wrong within a week of publication? <laughs> <laughs> right, it shouldn't have been a book if if it stops being true after a week or two weeks or three weeks, um, and so there's a lot there's a lot of benefits to the digital the, the digitization of book publishing, but um, a lot of the old ways of work of the editing, the reading, the when is it good enough is super subjective, right? Like okay, it's good, like we've worked on it enough, let's ship it and see what happens, right? All of that is is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to that decision where you realized, okay, this is ready, I'm ready to hit publish? Because I know that there are some people who struggle with the same thing where eventually you have to stop working on the thing and you just have to launch it. So how did you come to that decision? Well, that's the biggest risk of self-publishing, right? So if you're working, particularly if you're working by yourself without any kind of accountability to anybody, I have a friend uh, who's been writing a book for a long time and and He's continuing to write it because he can, he can edit it forever, right? When is it done? So it really, really helps to have some kind of accountability partner, whether that's an editor or um, a ghostwriter or a friend or somebody who says, look, ship it. It's, it, could be, it could be a writing partner. That's really helpful as well. I've written a lot of books with Josh Seiden. We work really well together. And, it, and the nice thing is that we, we have this nice push and pull relationship where he, he'll always want to work on it a bit longer and I will, I'm always impatient to ship it sooner. And so it really balances out because, you know, I, I speed him up and he slows me down. And then at some point we're like, okay, that's it. We're shipping it. It's, it's done. But there, there's no, there's no, it's, it's subjective, right? It's, it's your opinion or your editor's opinion or your publisher's opinion that, that it's done. There's no, 
real market validation for it. I mean, you can publish tweets, you can publish short blog posts or medium articles with content from the book to get a sense of what resonates and how well it resonates. But that, that only tells you whether there's a market for the book. It doesn't tell you when it's actually done. And so at some point, you have to ship it. And I would just, I would push very, very hard for external validation that it is good because look, we all love our own ideas and we think our writing is awesome, but it's good to get some external opinions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's, so that's very right. helpful advice to anyone who's got write a book on their New Year's or 2020, uh, 2022 goals list. I'm yeah. sure they'll find that very helpful. Uh, so I'd love to spend the next few minutes picking your brain on all things product management. Sure. First of all, what do you think are some of the major myths and misconceptions surrounding product management as it is today? I was just dealing with this with a client recently. So I'm, I'm helping to build a product management training uh basically a school, if you will. It's a large client, it's like 10,000 employees, right? And they, they're trying to build an in-house product management practice. They don't really have an official one. And so they'd like to build an in-house training program that'll kind of get folks into product management, both in existing employees and new hires as well. And one of their misconceptions, um, and this is one that I see all the time, is it, because this has become a very popular theme, despite it being refuted multiple times, is that Product managers are the CEOs of the product. Uh, we hear that a lot. There, you know, there's a very popular essay that speaks to it, and and there's this perception that product managers need to be the the CEOs of the product. And the reality is that CEOs have authority. They have decision making capability. They can hire. They can fire. They can make absolute decisions based on whims or whatever they want. There's no product manager in the world that can do that, right? Product managers have to convince, they have to storytell, they have to the lead laterally, they have to, to encourage and excite people to come along with them. They have to sell the vision and, and really kind of bring the organization and their teams with them and bring them to consensus rather than dictate decisions to them. And that's a huge misconception, I think, in many organizations that were minting a bunch of mini CEOs of the product. And if you set those expectations for people and then they go to work and they say, great, I want to make a decision, right? We're not building this feature. We're going to build this feature. And then somebody comes in and says, no, 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 you got to build that other feature. The boss wants it, right? You realize very quickly you're the CEO of nothing, right? And so it, it's a much, much different type of leadership, right? You're still managing the vision. You're still managing the product, but the leadership style is much more collaborative. It's much more inclusive. It's much more, I want to say democratic. And I think it's, I think it's democratic to, to an extent, right? At some point you've got to make a decision. And, and if there is no consensus, maybe you do get to make a call, but that's not, that's not your go-to sort of default, uh, management and leadership methods. And so there's, um, I think that's a huge misconception. Mm -hmm, definitely. It's my favorite misconception to debunk as well. Yeah. Um, so we, we touched a little bit on in that on the topic of leadership, which is something that as a community at Product School, we were talking about uh, all of last month and we got into some really, uh, really juicy stuff. Um, what would you say are some of the main attributes of a great leader that sets them apart from just the good leaders? Like what does greatness look like in leadership? To me, the most important quality in leadership is humility. It's in short supply, and there's an inverse uh, ratio of the quantity of humility and the job title that you have. <laughs> the further up you go, the less humility there is. And I think it's because humility is misunderstood. People think that humility is the abdication of vision or the abdication of leadership, right? And I disagree. I think that humility is the ability to change course in the face of evidence, right? So you're going to have strong opinions. You're going, because that's your job. Your job is to have a strong opinion about strategically where the organization is going. Uh, your job is to have strong opinion about constraints and guidelines and budgets and, and whatever else, right? Target, target market, opportunities, all that kind of stuff, right? That's great. Recognize that those are your best guesses about how to, the company will succeed. And as the organization begins to march towards those uh, strong opinions of yours, if the evidence that comes back from the market contradicts those strong opinions, you should be willing to change course. 
that's very, it. very good advice in there. Definitely. Humility got to be number one every time. Yeah, it's um, rare. Uh, and as people start sort of climbing the career ladder in product management, sometimes we hear that there's a little bit of like uh, an inner saboteur that's telling them, oh, you're not you're not good enough to do this. You don't have the right background for this. Um, what advice would you have for people to sort of overcome their imposter syndrome and, you know, continue climbing the ladder? I think, uh, look, I think imposter, so number one, I think imposter syndrome is natural. Uh, I heard somebody say once that only imposters don't have imposter syndrome. Um, I think all of us feel that way at times. I mean, look, I feel that way. I've been, I've had a decent amount of success, right? And I still feel that way, particularly when you step out on a big stage in front of a couple thousand people and you're like, why are they listening to me? <laughs> it's just going to, I'm going to leave and go the other way. I think the bottom line is this. Um, everyone's got a, a unique story. Everyone's got a unique background. And uh, that's what sets you apart, right? I think, and, and if you can lean into your, your story and your background, then you can translate that into whatever you want it to be. And particularly pro product management is interesting because it is flexible, right? Product management at Google is not product management at Bank of America, is not product management at Expedia, right? Like every single company is different. And so what that says to me is that you can take your unique background and if product is a direction that you'd like to head in, you can find things that you've done in the past that will help make you a better product manager. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go out and learn new skills. It doesn't mean that you're going to try some stuff and not be good at it at first, right? But uh, that's how we learn. And that, look, I, like again, your, your point is perfect, right? Like I, I was a touring musician for six or seven years and I uh, became a designer and then, and then a product manager and a team leader and an author, right? And, and that stuff helps. It, and, and if you, if you, watch my talks or you read my books, right? Those stories are in there. Those stories of, of being in the band. I used to work in the circus years ago. The stories of working in the circus, right? Et cetera. It's like that's lean into that background and make it a part of, of whatever career you're targeting. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I, I see we're coming down to our last couple of minutes. So I'm just going to squeeze in a few more fun questions. Uh, what advice would you go back and give your younger self as you were getting started in the tech industry? Um, I would say to, to read more. I don't believe I read enough. I, I think like there's a lot of like, oh, I know stuff and I'll just learn on the job. There's so much out there to learn from, from others. People are so generous in giving away their knowledge these days online. Just keep consuming anything that you can. Yeah. And if that's the product school blog, that's absolutely fine. I recommend it very highly. I should know because I write it. <laughs> Um, and what's something that you're really excited for in the future of the tech industry or in the product industry rather? Um, look, for me, uh, I, I think there's, uh, I'm super interested in the, the applications of, of new technology. So augmented reality looks really interesting. Uh, there is, there is a future with blockchain and, and crypto and all this NFT stuff. I don't know what it is yet. I'm not 100 sold. We're, we're quite there yet, but there is there is a lot to a lot of value in the tech. Right now, we've got a solution looking for a problem. I'm excited for finding the problems that these things can help solve. Definitely, it's sometimes more interesting to have the solution, and you're like, "Huh, this is going to be cool." I don't know what for, yeah. but I, I, I sense that sometime soon it will be really cool for something. For sure. Um, so unfortunately, all the time we have left for is to say goodbye. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. And of course, Jeff, thank you so much for generously giving us your time. It's been really fun. My pleasure, Ellen. Thanks so much for having me on. And we will see the rest of you in the next Fireside Chat. Don't forget to pick up copies of Jeff's books because they sound amazing. <laughs> goodbye, everyone. See you all very soon.